Thanks to the organizers of FOPEN 2023. Uh, my name is John Hedengren, and I'm going to be talking today about data-driven engineering education with hands-on learning. Now, I'll give an outline of current trends in computing and some data-driven engineering tutorials and how to best utilize some of the large language models, some of the other technologies that are currently available. Also, talk a little bit about some of the developments in, in these areas and then also some conclusions as well. So data-driven engineering is one of six courses that I've developed for online instruction. I'm going to go through a little bit of some of the modules. We're going to have some hands-on learning exercises with these, uh, but then I'll also briefly cover some of the other courses as well. Now, one of the reasons why I'm excited about this topic is that uh, a couple of years ago, I did a project for an offshore oil and gas company on an uh, underwater pontoon that was about 200, 150 feet below the sea. And we were doing a first of a kind project where we are installing fiber optic sensors onto these web frames to try to infer tendon tensions uh, down to this, in this deep water platform. As these tendons attach to the seafloor, it's very important to know the tendon tension. Well. One of the issues with this is that when we went out there, uh, we had a week of quarantine. It was during the height of COVID and our fiber optic expert, uh, he got a positive test. And so we were wondering, what do we do? And uh, we quickly went onto YouTube, learned as much as we could about fusion splicing and me and another engineer made this project happen. Now I was supposed to be at the computer but instead, I was down in this pontoon the whole time, and uh, we got these sensors connected. Well, one of the issues is this was a first-of-kind project, and we didn't know if it was going to work. But um, what happened is, um, you know, we got all the data back, and we needed to process it. There was some data cleansing that needed to happen. It was collecting these fiber optic sensors a thousand times per second. You need to average those down to about you know, 10 times per second, send those values through another intermediate computer that would send it to yet another computer for the operator to be able to look at the tendon loads. And uh, some of the finite element analysis that we had done on this platform and plugging in that translation matrix between the strain gauges and the tendon tensions it didn't work. In fact, it was giving us the wrong answer. And we were thinking that all of this investment and time and in installing all of these sensors, you know, just didn't work out. But um, what I did is in that moment, I said, well, let me try machine learning on this and see if we can just learn the relationship between the tendon tensions and the sensors. And so we used uh, some regression methods, evaluated a few different ones, ended up uh, that linear regression worked better than any of the others for extrapolation. We use that and the project was a success. Well, one of the things that I learned from this was that some of the data engineering, be able to move numbers around, cleanse data, be able to present them in the right format, that took most of the time. And the linear regression was just a single simple step to be able to translate it into something useful. But be able to move data, be able to curate data, be able to accept real-time data, be able to process that is a very important skill to have. And so I wanted to develop a course that would help engineers in particular be able to address some of these pre-processing steps with data. So let's uh, talk a little bit about this course, Data-Driven Engineering. Here's the website. We're gonna go through just a flavor of some of the examples on this website. Now let's first of all talk about current trends in computing. So as we're talking about data-driven engineering, which programming language would we want to teach? And you can see that you know, over time, the most popular language has changed based on you know, the development of the World Wide Web and applications for that. Uh, you know, programmers, what they're using on a day-to-day -day basis. But one of the things you can see here is the emergence of Python in that. And it's a further accelerated even beyond 2019. 
You know, 22 percent of projected growth in jobs uh, is expected over the next decade, and that is development, Q&A, uh, analysis, testing. So many, many positions that are available, and also you know there's other scientific languages listed on here. You know there's MATLAB that's also on the top 20. There's others. And so there are many different languages, and we want to be able to teach a language that's going to have a lot of impact, but also be able to anticipate, you know, are there other languages like Julia coming? You know, MATLAB is actually making a move up on some of the lists. So there are many different options for some of these scientific computing languages that are able to do these types of projects. So let's go through this data-driven engineering. I had the first seven modules, I just wanted to give an introduction to Python with some of the basics, tuples, lists, sets, dictionaries, NumPy and Pandas is two of the numerical Python packages be able to work with data. So here are the, the introductory modules and you can see the different topics associated with each of those. And let's just delve into this first one. Okay, so this one is NumPy, and this is number six in that list. And so I'm just gonna come down here to the website. All right, and if you come down here to the, okay, this is going to be the Google Colab. The easiest thing is just to go ahead and select this. It'll run through your browser, and you could run some of these exercises. All right, so you can go through this. Um, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about NumPy, it'll take you through some of the basics with NumPy. But what I wanted to really get to right here was just exercise 6A. Okay, exercise 6A says, uh, create Y as a five by five NumPy array of ones. Modify the array to place zeros along the diagonal. Now, some of you are going to say, well, I know exactly how to do that. And you'll start coding it and you'll figure it out just by, uh, you know, working through it based on your prior knowledge. But let's say you're just learning this for the first time. So think as an instructor, what we need to give to students to be able to learn how to do tasks like this, okay, as introductory examples. And what I want to do is, is have you work on this first, go ahead and work on it, and then I'm going to share some resources that we can give to students or make students aware of to be able to enhance their learning experience. So I'm going to come back here now and uh, just uh, continue on with this. Okay, so go ahead and work through this yourself. Maybe pause the video and and uh, so I'm going to just first of all post this into ChatGPT. Okay, and you can do this into other ones as well as Llama. Bard and others. Okay, and it's gonna give you the answer. It'll even run it for you and tell you what the output is. Now I'd suggest that the learning from this is, is not very effective, okay? So somebody that just does this, um, plugs it into ChatGPT, gets the answer and moves on. Uh, they've learned how to use ChatGPT, but not necessarily learned that much unless they've studied the answer uh, but, but the process of struggling with it and trying it themselves is lost. Okay, so what might be a better way to do this? So prompt learning. So this metacognition about our learning process and how we can most effectively learn. So let's see ChatGPT maybe and these other large language models as a tool for learning. So maybe as you're going along, help me find the error in my code without showing the answer, but you know, guide me to the answer. Explain each line of this Python code to a MATLAB user. Maybe you're more familiar with MATLAB. Generate a similar example. Okay, be able to see it from uh, you know, a different angle or see uh, another example might help as well. Can I make this more Pythonic? So that's a key word for making it more compact, a single way of doing something. Okay, so more simplistic. Uh, they like to get it down to one liner sometimes uh, if it's Pythonic, but uh, you know can make it more compact and easier to read and understandable. Okay, you can also say test my knowledge of NumPy Linspace with a quiz, and it'll generate a few questions, multiple choice, 
and um, okay, summarize what we've discussed so far. Okay, translate this code to MATLAB. Let's say you're familiar with another language and you're confused by you know the syntax. Sometimes translating it to a language that you do know helps you put it in context, and understand what each step is doing. Okay, and then maybe something else for students that are having a hard time engaging with the subject in the first place. So I'm interested in maybe soccer or football or basketball. Why is this important to know? And then it's going to come up with a couple reasons why it's important to know uh, this scientific language to be able to help you become a more effective athlete, let's say. Okay, so uh, go back to that example again, okay? and work through some of these prompts as you as you generate your response and just think about the way you're learning about it and how this could be used as an effective resource not just to get the answer but to help with the learning process okay so let me come forward a little bit more and one of the talks that just recently came out Salman Khan who does Khan Academy uh, he shared some research, uh, not his, but another paper about summative achievement scores when we take and, and uh, improve the student to teacher ratio. Now that's well known as you uh, have a single teacher, a tutor with a single student, you get more effective learning and your below average students become average learners and your average learners become above average learners. And so how can we use, as he suggested, AI to enhance human intelligence or HI? So a very interesting talk. I, I recommend that you also look at this and think about the ways that we can use some of these new tools to enhance education. So and the other thing I'd like to suggest is that maybe as teachers and as learners, we can challenge ourselves to move to higher levels of learning, such as in the Bloom's taxonomy on the left, get beyond some of the remembering, the understanding and applying up into the creating, the evaluating, the analyzing. It also allows us to tackle more interesting problems in terms of value versus the synthesis uh, chart here, where we can do more of the synthesis to get us to some of these higher levels of value where we can forecast, we can do predictive modeling, we can do optimization because we're beyond some of those, you know, why, what happened, okay? How many, how often, where, where exactly is the problem, what actions are needed to more of the why is this happening? What if these trends continue? What will happen next? What's the best that can happen? And so we encourage students to start asking some of these more difficult questions because they're able to do more and be able to accelerate their learning. Okay, so let's go on through some more of this course as well. There's data import, and this is very important once you've gained a foundation of a programming language like Python. Okay, what can we do with text, audio, video? How do we process some of this data with a database? What about interfacing to sensors, and how do you actually collect that data from a thermocouple or from a pressure sensor or from a flow meter. And then also cloud storage and processing. And why is that important? How can we use some of those resources, even knowing like what is a Lambda function? How can we use Amazon Web Services? How can we use the Azure platform? How can we use Google Cloud Services, Alibaba Cloud? There's many other cloud providers. And just being familiar with some of these types of APIs or authentication services or others, very, very important. And then finally, web scraping. So be able to pull in weather information, be able to pull in uh, other types of information that's out there on the World Wide Web and do that in an automated fashion to help with the data collection and curation. Okay, so text data, audio data, video data, databases, MicroPython, that's our sensors be able to work with Python to be able to collect uh, data off of some of these embedded devices, and then uh, cloud, okay, and then web scraping. So let's go through just another example here. This is the text uh, data analysis, and when you get onto the website, 
I just go to uh, the number one text uh, during under the data access. So I'm just going to come here to data access. Okay, I'll go back. Um, all right, and if I come down on schedule, I'll see that's number one here, or I can come down on the right and, um, okay, it's going to be right here under data access. So I'll go ahead and select that one, open it up, and you know all of the module is here as well. It's gonna be just importing a CSV file, a data file, and then we're gonna work with it. And in this case, we're gonna work with automobile data. and for those that want to, there are simple OBD2 ports uh, that are available to be able to plug in these modules and be able to stream data to your smartphone, and you can analyze the data from your own vehicle. But I've collected some data from a couple different vehicles, and let's just go ahead and work with that through this Google Colab link that's right here. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is, oh, you know, for the purposes of this, I'm going to go ahead and run it all, but I encourage you to go through this one as well if you want to go through it in sequence. But we're just going to come down to the very bottom, okay? And this one is going to be, okay, a case study with some automobile data right here, or we import uh, the zip file that, uh, as you unzip it, it'll be a CSV file, and we'll read it in to Python. All right, we're gonna skip a couple rows at the beginning. We'll describe the data, so it'll give us GPS, vehicle speed, instantaneous fuel economy, fuel rate, engine power, and so on. Okay, so 51 columns, eight rows here as we describe it, uh, but there are many rows in this. Okay, so driving for about 45 minutes, I believe. Okay, and I'm gonna go through the first 10 rows, just looking at those. All right, I'll do some data cleansing of that, be able to strip out some spaces that are there in the, um, in the headers, okay? So I just needed to you know, uh, modify the data a little bit so I can read it in. You can see some spaces right here. So I just wanted to remove those. So before and after, you can see that. And then, um, you know, remove any rows with the bearing, negative one. So sensors are still initializing. And so I recognize one of the, the data points that was bad. So we just filter that, remove the last five rows. Uh, some of those might have been bad as well. And I'll keep every 10th row. All right, so colon, colon, 10. And I'll set time as index. I'll add a column that's a calculated column from the others. And then we want to start visualizing the data. All right, and here we can see uh, we're looking at some of the values that we're interested in. We might even do a parity plot, uh, you know, the correlations, be able to look at um, you know, the distribution of the values and look for outliers or common trends that might be there in that data. And then maybe finally a little bit of GIS, be able to look at some of the data. So this was uh, data from Puerto Rico. And you can see as you mouse over it, you can see some of the, the data that's there. Okay, so very nice uh, analysis. It lets you see some of these things. You can customize this as well. But let's go ahead and just compare this with another one. Okay, so here's another data set. Maybe you want to compare two drivers and something about the two drivers and how they drive. All right, so I do some data cleansing and preparation. And I could come up there and uh, you know copy some of those down or I can just take this and um, you know come up here and paste that in as my data file and just rerun this same type of analysis on it. Okay, so I'm just gonna change the file name right here and rerun this one. Okay, it's gonna import it, I'll describe it. Let's look at our data header. Okay, these are numbers that look good. Uh, you know, it's imported, we'll have the same issue with those columns. We'll remove any bearing temperatures that are negative, remove the last five rows, keep every 10th data point just to make it a little bit more compact. We'll set our time index, calculate this new column, and let's go ahead and just visualize the data. 
Okay, so it's going to run this. Here's my speed in miles per hour and fuel rate and other things. But now we get down to you know where we might want to compare the two and compare two drivers. I wrote over the data frame, so it's, it'd be difficult to compare. But you could do a comparison, uh, create some of these parity plots, um, and be able to see the comparison between the two drivers. Okay, and then let's just go ahead and map this one as well. All right, so this one was in Iowa, okay? And you can see the path uh, and how they drove and uh, some of the speed and uh, latitude, longitude, and fuel rate, for example. All right, so that's another yet another example here of uh, another module with some data that's there. We do encourage students to be able to collect their own data if possible. All right, let's talk a little bit about data transfer. Now, this was one of the issues that I had in that project on the offshore platform that I needed to use a, a protocol such as OPC UA or Modbus to be able to move numbers from one computer to another, you know, a couple hundred values at about 10 times per second and have that be very reliable. So they already had a Modbus server there, so I just used the, uh, the Modbus connection, did all of that with Python. All right, so tutorial on Modbus, MQTT for Internet of Things. It's a very common protocol with uh, broker and clients uh, where you can move values, especially with some of these ad hoc networks that where the connection might fail. All right, so it's very good for that. Modbus is an older standard used in industrial control and PLC applications. OPC is a newer standard that's commonly used in industrial control systems, especially with distributed control systems, where you have external computers that then connect into, uh, be able to collect historical data or be able to communicate, okay, bi-directionally. There's also web sockets. We do cover some of the other uh, RESTful APIs, gRPC, uh, and some of the trade-offs with some of those as well, but not in a lot of detail, as much as these that are focused on more industrial applications. Okay, so for the re remainder of my talk, I want to talk, we've talked about data-driven engineering, but there are many others that then use data-driven engineering as a foundation to be able to build upon it, and some of the educational needs that are out there to be able to then build upon learning Python, learning how to move data, learning how to curate it, and then what do you do with it? How do you take that data and create value? And so there's the machine learning for engineers uh, course that we developed as well. And this one, uh, you've seen a lot of machine learning courses that are out there. And many of those are taught in a computer science department, and many of them teach you how to develop the method. So you might code up a neural network, be able to train it, uh, do back, back propagation. Now this course is different because it does go into the methods, but it's more focused on the applications of machine learning and how we can use those as an engineer. And so use those packages, uh, understand the fundamentals, but not necessarily code those from scratch. Be able to use packages such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, and others, and really give a solid foundation to enable somebody to move beyond the amateur state into uh, fairly competent, be able to add value to an organization. So as you look at this video of you know, self-driving car, you think about all the different types of machine learning that are going into that to make that happen. It had to identify a stop sign, it has to identify the lanes. You can see the things on the right, the classifiers that are running on the computer vision to identify the lanes, be able to identify the in-path objects uh, and uh, road signs, for example, and objects. You can see the driver is going to get out of the car and have the car go find a parking spot. Now the car will go into an autonomous mode. It will you can see a map that comes up there, it identifies the streets, it finds a parking spot, and then parks itself and waits for the driver to come back out and be summoned. So this type of transformation is happening all around us. And you can see you know, within this circle here, you can see some of the ways that we use machine learning on a daily basis or that it might have touched your life in some way.
okay every time you receive one of those emails hey did you really use this credit card here um, you know that's online fraud detection they've gotten much better as a classifier to be able to detect some of these uh, more suspicious purchases okay email filtering saved email okay before that many of us were getting you know many many spam messages and now it's doing a better job filtering out the ones that are legitimate from those that aren't all right but you can see some of the ways it's interacting with us on a daily basis as engineers we need to be able to understand the methods that go into building some of these so here's the machine learning roadmap again just like in data driven engineering we start from the foundations if you have data uh, and you, or if you don't have data, insufficient data, or maybe you don't trust your data, maybe a simulator is available. And so you can use a physics-based digital twin, simulate the data, and then be able to combine with, it, with the data that you do have. Uh, do a data assessment. If you don't have sufficient data, then you need to do more of feature engineering, be able to increase the data diversity, be able to understand maybe the, the information matrix, uh, you know, do other types of analysis, see if we're going to be able to get the answer that we need. Uh, there are outlier detection and filters, be able to cleanse the data and then scale the data. And then finally split the data into a train, validate, and test. Uh, if you have labels, you can do supervised learning, partial labor labels, semi-supervised learning, and no labels would be unsupervised learning for classification, regression, or clustering. And finally, the most important thing is performance assessment. Did it meet the business objective? And if not, you cycle back and you go through this cycle again, uh, further improving and iterating on this until you're able to meet the business objective. So you look at uh, you know the data-driven modeling languages and how those have increased over time. And one of the other projects that we've worked on with MathWorks is to translate this course from Python into MATLAB. And you can see the one on the left versus the one on the right. I had a group of students do this, and they mentioned that, you know, that uh, ChatGPT was very helpful in helping them translate the course and be able to get at least a starting point where they could then go in and refine and verify the MATLAB code. But that those modules are coming out uh, soon. These are going to be uh, MATLAB live scripts uh, where they're interactive and engaging, be able to learn machine learning either in Python or MATLAB. The same examples will be available in both. Okay, so as we navigate machine learning, there's classification, regression, clustering, dimensionality reduction. And a lot of what we, you know, we don't wanna just jump into a machine learning algorithm, but be able to navigate and understand which one is the right direction. What, are, what problem are we actually trying to solve? And could something that's a regression just become a classification. We heard that earlier in this conference, an example where the classification was the right thing versus, you know, just using a regression. And then understanding the methods, you know, what is their speed? So naive Bayes, even though it's a very weak classifier, it's often used, uh, especially for large data sets, because it's so fast and because you only need one feature uh, to be able to create that discriminator for the classifier. So it's often very effective for large data sets. Uh, then you go on to engineering optimization. So beyond machine learning, now we're going up uh, even higher, not just be able to predict what's going to happen or be able to predict, uh, you know, classify or regress, but now how can we optimize? And so th this additional course, uh, you know, both in Python and MATLAB, uh, to be able to understand the engineering principles that go into optimization. So let's do another exercise here. This one's going to be a tubular column. And if you want to scan this and go to the example, uh, I'll just highlight something else that's interesting. You know, I posted all this material many years ago, and uh, you know, so I tested it out on uh, ChatGPT. And so I asked it to optimize a tubular column uh, design with Python Gecko. Okay. And it went to work and it, um, you know, gave me some example code. It gave me, you know, some uh, length of the column. It came up with example values. And it was very similar to some of the, the problem that I had posted. So I was really happy about that because, 
you know, as educators, we want to have an impact. And sometimes, you know, the best impact that we can have is to be able to integrate some of our teaching materials into these large language models that are going to be used more commonly and develop more extensively. So I just want to highlight that as an added benefit of posting some of your material online as these online learning modules as we share and collaborate. It's not just for other professors now, but it's also going to be for these large language models to be able to learn these subjects. And as educators, as we teach these, give materials for these large language models, we're going to be teaching and increasing our impact in the educational realms. So let's just take this one step further. Uh, let's create a contour plot of the optimal solution. Okay, so it shows how to create a contour plot because we not only want to understand where is the optimal, but why is it the optimal? Okay, what are the constraints that define that boundary? And um, so it's going to come through and create this a contour plot with a couple of modifications. You know, let's say we want to show the constraints on the contour plot. And um, with a couple of modifications, we come up with uh, something that's very similar to what I had posted. Uh, and you can see the optimum, but you can also see the different constraints as they have to be on that lot side of the blue and red line. And there you can see the star that's going to be the lowest, um, the lowest cost, or uh, you know, with the mean diameter and the half uh, thickness. Okay, so also uh, you know Python uh, and MATLAB for process dynamics and control. So as we talk about data-driven engineering and data instruction, one of the things that we do in this course is go through this course, but with every homework assignment, we have a theory simulation but then also they use this temperature control lab for their exercises. And what this temperature control lab does is you're using real data to reinforce physics-based modeling, graphical fitting, first order plus dead time modeling, uh, PID tuning, feed forward, uh, stability analysis. So each one of these modules has an experimental where they're collecting their own data and everybody gets a slightly different answer. For the students, uh, one of the reasons that in increases their ability to learn is they see how it applies to a real system, even if it's a very simplified system. And they also see some of the issues with real data, having noise, for example, and where it's a real-time event where your calculations can't happen slower than the cycle time of the controller. All right, so you have two heaters and two temperature sensors in this. And we can do things all the way up to from simple PID up to moving horizon estimation and model predictive control. So I just want to emphasize we're in a period where we're drowning in data but starving for information. We need to take this data and be able to turn it into actionable information. And as engineers, we need to be able to be comfortable working with large data sets and be able to use these. So cars, self-driving cars, 25 gigabytes an hour, wind farms, uh, might be 150,000 points a second, a turbine engine, 51,000 gigabytes per hour. And then you look at something like the drilling industry with wired drill pipe and how you know, technologies such as this have enabled high speed and bi-directional uh, communication within drill strings. And they use these couplers uh, to be able to transmit uh, even when pipe connections are made. So as a new pipe connection is made, uh, you have an inductive coupler and then a coaxial cable that's embedded in the drill string. So that's just one example of where we've gone from very slow mud pulse rates to something very high speed. You look at other examples like the Aquila project. Uh, this was Facebook, now Meta. Uh, where they were trying to do a proof of concept. And one of the things that we ran into in this project is that you know, propeller design would change. And we'd use some of that data to be able to incorporate it into our model and re-simulate it, trying to get up to this 24-hour uh, flight at 35 degrees north latitude at winter solstice, which is the most challenging condition for a solar-powered, uh, high-altitude, long-endurance aircraft. And it, optimization did some very interesting things. But this is another example where we're working with uh, solar uh, predictions, with uh, propeller data, 
with and try to fuse these into an application where we can design and control this high altitude long endurance aircraft. Another example is that's near and dear to me is uh, biomechanics and be able to do biomechanic regression, for example. Uh, this is something that we've worked on recently to try to help runners be able to avoid injury. And one of the things that we've seen in the literature is that 40% of injuries are related to hip drop. And so what I'm gonna do is just analyze the hips of my running form, okay? And if you have more than five, per, five degrees uh, hip drop as a male or seven degrees hip drop as a female, there are some exercises that you can do to improve that, to improve your hip strength and be able to reduce the risk of injury. So between 19 and 79% of runners uh, each year get injured, and that uh, is the, one of the major causes of why you stop exercising. And so an app like this uh, can help, but as an engineer, we need to be able to know about data pipelines, be able to ingest that video. How do we process it? How do we display it back through a website, for example? Okay, so these are the types of applications where these, uh, these instruction, these things are important. We also want to be able to use some of these digital twins. Uh, this is another drilling, this is a drilling simulator here. Uh, but then also we've heard a lot in this conference about this physics informed data driven modeling. And so how do we apply some of these methods into that optimization framework? So we're working with PNNL right here on, and Martha Grover is also working on some related things to be able to get real time sensors with IR and others to be able to characterize the waste as it comes into these vitrifiers. Uh, but how do we use some of the Gaussian processes, uh, Gaussian process regression, and others directly in these optimization approaches? And we have to be able to import those into the packages that allow us to solve these very efficiently. So many different types of models. You have everything from linear to nonlinear. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on these, but you can see the orange, those are more of the physics driven uh, versus the blue, those are more of the empirical. Um, okay, and we're working to, you know, in, in education as well, you want to be able to make these methods available broadly without uh, requiring somebody to be able to know the detailed theory. Okay, just like has happened with some of the machine learning packages. Uh, can we make some of these available? Now, this is our project with Seek and be able to select the data and be able to select some of these different model structures for time series and then be able to identify the models and deploy those in applications such as model predictive control or predictive uh, maintenance or others. Okay, so just a little bit about our research. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk here about large language models and uh, you know, how those have affected education, but they can also affect uh, you know, how we, you know, what we teach going forward. So you know, PID, MPC, you might be able to use transformers as well for model predictive control. Here we have, uh, for example, um, the attention mechanism. It tells which parts of our time series are important. So this really helps uh, to understand time delay and other things where something that happened earlier in the past is going to be able to affect the outcome. So it helps us be able to identify the parts of the input that are important to be able to predict the output. And one of the advantages of the transformer architecture versus LSTM is just shorter processing time, no vanishing gradient, and it captures the irregular temporal dependency. And we're starting to use these in model predictive control as well with uh, either a shooting method or you know, just replacing the controller and the optimizer all together with the transformer. Okay, so here we have uh, receding window snapshots. Uh, we have to transform the data into the right form to allow us to be able to uh, process it through this transformer. So that's part of the trick of using, repurposing some of these transformer tools or for large language models into something that can help us be able to predict dynamic responses. All right, and so, you know, what is the future of data-driven control? Where are we gonna be going? Uh, you know, there's a lot of questions about that. And, uh, 
you know, one of the key things that's kind of emerged from this conference is about physics-informed neural networks and, and how we combine some of the physics-based information in with the empirical. And so I think that's a very important thing to even, as we're teaching some of these things, not just what's the current practice, but what's coming in the future. Where can we point people, especially graduate students or other aspiring undergraduates, or even those in industry that are interested in these topics, where can we point them and say, hey, here's a future where we might want to develop more. So here's just our physics informed neural network. Show it takes less training data and uh, time to be able to capture this response. I'd like to thank as well my graduate students and collaborators that have worked with me so closely and also our industrial sponsors, uh, support from MathWorks, um, Seek, uh, and many others that have contributed to this project and um, also it helped to enhance the educational tools that are out there to be able to help industry and academia, uh, professors and students alike uh, with some of these resources. So thank you for your attention and I'll be glad to answer any questions.